All right. Well, I think we'll go ahead and get started because I know we have a jam packed day today. Um, hi, everybody, and welcome to our keynote presentation. Um, today, I'm really excited to welcome and introduce Derek Jefferson. Derek is an associate librarian at American University in Washington, DC, where he focuses on research and instruction and is a subject specialist and liaison to AU's School of Communication. His research is focused on justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion issues, specifically in higher education libraries and mentoring new librarians to the profession. Derek earned his MLIS from Louisiana State University and his MFA from Art Center College of Design. He was selected as an ALA Emerging Leader in 2015, is an alum of the Institute for Research Design in Librarianship at Loyola Marymount University, and is currently enrolled in the Certificate in OER Librarianship at the University of Minnesota. He is also an award-winning writer with prose appearing in Tahoma Literary Review, Tri-Quarterly, The Adroit Journal, and the anthology Fat and Queer. Um, today during the session, I just wanted to let you know that you can raise your hands, um, do a little raise hand function when you want to chime in, share your thoughts, or you can also throw thoughts and responses into the chat and we'll kind of keep an eye on that. And so today, please um, well, help me welcome Derek. We are so uh, excited and grateful to have him here today as our ARLD Day 2022 keynote speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jenny. I know that you've worked so hard to get us to this point. So I certainly want to acknowledge your hard work. Um, it's good to see you again. And it's good to be with everyone in the great state of Minnesota. How is everybody doing? I just want to do like a little bit of a check in. Um, if you could do me a favor in the chat, tell me, um, what are you looking forward to this weekend? Are you streaming something interesting? Uh, it is TGIF Friday. Um, I hear the weather is nice there. Um, I'm just, I want to get a feel of my colleagues there in Minnesota. I do have some really good friends. I see some, some familiar names in the chat. Look at all this. It is Mother's Day. Oh my goodness. I have to call my stepmom. Woo. Tell it on myself. Yes. Baseball. Being outside without a jacket on. Yes, Peter. Let those short sleeves fly. Awesome. Oh, Julia, I'm sorry you're working. We're there with you in spirit. I love it. I love it. Resting, very important. Awesome. I'm glad to be with you all today. So um, I am going to get started. Let me change my view and close the chat so I'm not so distracted and uh, fire up my conversation. Okay, and I really do want this to be a conversation. Okay, so let's get started. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming out and clicking on a little Zoom link. I know we've done a lot of that over the last couple of years. Um, I appreciate you spending some time with me and my thoughts this morning, depending on where you are across the state. Uh, before I begin, just a couple things. I am speaking to you this morning from the District of Columbia, our nation's capital city. Uh, the new United States Capitol is surrounded by just over a dozen tribal nations that thrive along the Anacostia and Potomac River watersheds and in the Chesapeake Bay area in the states of Maryland, Virginia, and Delaware. Washington, D.C. sits on the ancestral lands of the Anacostans and neighbors the ancestral lands of the Piscataway. The District of Columbia shares borders with Maryland and Virginia and connects with lands along the Anacostia and Potom Potomac rivers. According to the National Park Service, the region was rich in natural resources and supported the local native people. 40 years after the arrival of the Europeans, only a quarter of the original occupants remained. Today, roughly 4,000 indigenous people live and thrive in present day Washington, D.C. In efforts to teach locals about their history and culture, communities like the Rappahannock tribe host annual celebrations in the national parks. Members of the state recognized tribe perform traditional songs and dances while sharing their community's culture and significance of the natural resources. Nonetheless, we are on the ancestral lands of many tribes and we can still get a glimpse into the traditional ways of the first people. 
I ask that wherever you dwell this morning to be mindful of the displaced indigenous people who are the original stewards of the land where each of us now all live. So thank you for that acknowledgement. I also wanna say that it's been a difficult stretch of time and there has been a lot of grief and loss and lying and deceit and pain. And I know that we have all struggled in some capacity over the last couple of years. Uh, I work at a university and I love working with all of the students, but especially our first year students. And I think about them a lot. Uh, in many ways, they have been robbed of what they perceived their whole lives from watching, you know, Animal House and Revenge of the Nerds. And uh, I don't know, are there any really good college movies? Um, as much as college is about learning how to write that annotated bibliography and learning how to cite tweets and uh, TikToks, I guess now, it's also about learning how to get along with your filthy, crazy roommate, uh, how to get to your work, study, job on time, how to figure out the laundry machines and how to deal with having your heart broken with unrequited love, right? We've all been there. Uh, with that in mind, where we are in time has also taken a toll on us. And while I'd like to think that I can keep it all together for my colleagues and students, sometimes we don't. And I'd like to think that if there was ever a time to embrace the concept of completely falling apart, it's where we are right now. You know, sometimes you end up merely glancing at your email and then end up binge watching an entire season of Project Runway in a day and that you just have to make your peace with it. So wherever you are this morning, I want you to know that I see you, I feel you, and I'm with you, and I appreciate you, e, all of you, being here with me today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about myself and how I got here, here being the academy, because it was something that I never, ever really saw for myself. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about the work that I do as a scholar and as a researcher and as an inquisitive person who was curious about everything and who can get lost in the deep dives in the resources of a rather rich university library system. Uh, all of this and I'm also going to talk about what it's like for me through my own personal lens as a black person in America and as a queer person in America and the insight it affords me as a marginalized and underrepresented member of the faculty in a profession that is largely white right 87% and, and largely female 80%. So I went back to school for library science at 37. I'd already attended graduate school in my 20s. I studied film and earned my MFA, focusing on writing and producing for television, uh, which in some respects was the throughway for how I ended up as a research librarian. Also, I'm a writer at my core. I love stories and storytelling. And rather than doing what we tend to see, certainly in library presentations, as we throw up our 5011 PowerPoint slides, there will be nary a slide. I just want to put that out there. I know librarians love PowerPoints, but Derek does not love PowerPoints and apparently refers to himself in a third person. Um, I will not subject you to that, and that is not shade. There are a couple of videos that I'll share, uh, and I just want to make sure that we set a time for some uh, questions and responses. Okay? All right, let's go. Let me double check and do one more look at the Zoom because I'm looking at my presentation and coming back and everyone is looking kosher. Awesome, cool. Let's keep the party going. Okay, so how did I get here? Like I said, I earned my MFA in film and was on my hustle to write and produce for television. I loved what we now call prestige TV. I loved everything that HBO was doing. I loved Oz, I loved The Sopranos, I loved The Wire before everyone loved The Wire. I loved Sex in the City. I studied film at a small art school in Pasadena. And at the time, the school was best known for producing Michael Bay, Tar Sim, and Zack Snyder, bless their hearts, getting them to Hollywood, directors who started out making these epic, visually stunning commercial and music video reels when they still made music videos and then using that as a launching pad to feature films. I, on the other hand, did not want to be a director and was known for my writing and my character development and especially the use of dialogue. Uh, there's this thing about being a writer and learning how to produce work at a program where everyone wants to direct is that you have your pick of who to work with. I punched up a lot of scripts that needed a little work uh, to help bring these very pricey and personal projects 
to fruition. I had a fun time. I learned a lot. I learned how to work with people. I learned how to fire people. Uh, but largely, I learned planning. Film sets are notoriously hierarchical. And a director of a project is the person at the top of that pyramid. They get a lot of the glory and deservedly so. However, if there is a film set and there are cameras and hair and makeup and actors and props and wardrobe and food and a crew, then your producer is the person to thank. So I was working with a classmate who got the opportunity to direct a music video for one of the guys from Hall and Oates. Hall and Oates, we're taking it back to the 80s, the one with the mustache, who um, recorded a solo album. And the video was for a track called It Girl featuring one influencer who was on her grind and was constantly covered in the tabloids named Paris Hilton. I should say now that I did not produce this project and only agreed to crew. Ooh, but child, let me tell you, it was a complicated shoot, not one that was very well organized and we all ended up working for free, which made it that much more difficult. Um, the least that you can do when you are not paying people uh, and you're having them work for free, and you're using free student labor, is to, I mean, I think, feed them well, and that did not happen. You know, check one, <laughs> red flag. Now, Miss Hilton is not a particularly tall girl. All of the wardrobe clothing we did have on set fit her, um, and she looked good in them. However, and this is T, don't tell anybody, she wears a size 10 shoe. And so sample sizes for shoes are usually a size seven. So again, problem. We ended up sending one, someone to um, like the drag queen shops on Hollywood Boulevard to find shoes that fit at seven in the morning. And this was just like a lot. This is also Paris Hilton. <laughs> so you're dealing with her and her people and her wealth and her entitlement and the person who walked around holding her dog in the purse. And she showed up in like a pink Ferrari or a Bentley or some other outrageous car. And it was just a lot. And I remember being on set that day saying, I have a master's degree in film. I have studied the French New Wave. I have fallen in love with neorealism. I learned so much about documentary and independent film. I've had meetings with producers who have read my little spec scripts and showed interest. And are we really sitting up on this ramshackle set with cold Panda Express and like bootleg bottled water? And so I thought, what might I, what should I do? <laughs> what, what am I doing with my life? I love Los Angeles, but I did not love the entertainment business. I had student loans that were exorbitant and I didn't relish the freelance life. I liked security. I liked healthcare. I liked having my teeth cleaned um, and all the things that go along with that on a regular basis on an ostensible full-time full, full -time job. So I had two friends that took me under their wing. Shout out to my good friend, Anna Lynn Martino, who is now the head of archives at Nickelodeon and Burbank. Um, and Cecily Walker, who is the GOAT at the Vancouver Public Library in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, who saw something in me that I did not see and could not see in me. And those vibes gently led me to consider librarianship as a profession. So I had my day job. And I thought I could take classes at night at UCLA once I decided upon actually pursuing librarianship. But it was December 2009, and I had just missed the deadline. And if I was going to attend UCLA, I was going to have to wait another year. And I wasn't sure if that was something that I could do. As a gag, a friend mentioned, you should go to school in New Orleans because they love Mardi Gras and they could come visit. And after poking around, I stumbled into a MLS grant, IMLS funded grant program at Louisiana State University called Project Recovery. The deadline was still three months out and they were looking to fully fund, fully fund graduate library science students to work in libraries affected by the storms of 2005 because there was still a deficit of librarians across the state. So I rushed out, I took the GRE, I wrote my statement, I filled out my app, I sent off my money. And on the day after my 37th birthday, 
received notification that I was accepted into the School of Library and Information Science, one of five scholars outside of the state of Louisiana to be awarded the grant. Four months later, I was a resident of New Orleans. I did not love library school. <laughs> By the end of the semester, I wanted to leave. The program was not what I thought it would be, and in many ways it felt old and outdated. It wasn't current regarding uh, issues of privacy and data and user information. These are things I care a lot about. Um, I started working at a library before my first class and found out that I would be teaching information literacy despite not knowing what that even really was. The library in question had been shut down. It took on 12 feet of water after the storms as it was mere feet from Lake Pontchartrain. And that water sat in that building for close to two weeks. 98% of the collection was lost. The then library was a mobile housing unit with three aged PCs and a wonky Wi-Fi hotspot. So part of this was me coming in with my like Southern California cool and expecting more than what was reasonable or realistic. The pace of life, of life moves slower in the South, and I knew this. My family is from the South, and we spent summers in Memphis. And yet, I really just wanted to do well in school and in New Orleans and do it proud, especially in the aftermath of Katrina. Trusted friends walked me back from the ledge, told me to just get the degree. This is the launching pad for everything that you want to do in the profession, and you're going to be fine. Just get through it. Get the degree. And so I did. I ended up working at four different schools in six different departments. And while I did not ever learn to love it, I am glad that I endured it because I learned so much. I learned that there were so many different kinds of organizations and archives and museums that in some way fell under the auspices of a library education. And I don't take any of that for granted. Specifically, being in New Orleans at the time gave me a unique outlook. How does an organization work when there's crisis? How does a library function in disaster? How do you get by when there is so little? Much of this um, kind of reared its head just in the last couple of years. And as I said then, you just find a way. There was a library director there who I worked with who was difficult. Honestly, I think they were dealing with a lot and much of our engagement was related to labor because my ability to work was integrated into this fully funded program. And today we see that one of the problematic things that ever seems to be present in libraries now is labor, especially with regard to degree holders, library staff, the people in between, who gets to be called a librarian and so forth. Frankly, they wanted me to always be available. And that wasn't possible because I had a part-time job. And at one point I was commuting 75 miles each way to Baton Rouge for class and then making time for assignments and homework. But again, labor and power and the tension between the two is something where this tension kind of rubs up against each other. So New Orleans is a lot of things. And one thing I really relished in my three years there was that it was just so black. And I dare say that blackness was one of those things that provided for me some resiliency, for lack of a better term, to get through that difficult period. Black folks in this country learn pretty early on about how America operates. I mean, friends, let's just face it. I am black. This informs how I walk through spaces and how I navigate my life and how I interact with the larger world and one more insular. I'm a gay man. I, am a, I can be very gay on occasion. And again, this compounds my place in this country because historically, this country hasn't been very kind to people who look and love as I do. So now let's talk about America and why this is. I feel it largely has to do with what America is at its core, a country by and for white people descended from European backgrounds 
and has since its inception 400 plus years ago. And so in the good year 2022, what does that look like for someone like me who lives an out and proud, defiant, queer, Black life? And someone who doesn't need external validation? Well, that's a threat because in the eyes of America, whose systems and existence and history is built on, on the idea of whiteness, whiteness is a structure that establishes and reinforces white supremacy, sustains white privilege, and reduces those of us that it has defined as other. It constrains us. It tends to be patriarchal, but isn't always. And while women and LGBTQ plus people and other intersectional marginalized people can find themselves set apart from the standardized white male heterosexual top of the food chain position of power, don't get it twisted, okay? Because white women and white queer people can often flex their whiteness and their privilege and their entitlement when it suits to benefit them. Moreover, when they're painted into a corner and threatened by BIPOC people. So I don't know what it's like to walk through this world as a white person and all of the entitlements that come with it, um, but I am a black person who was aware of how whiteness works and my proximity to it. I am, after all, someone who has applied for and have found employment at a university and higher ed, if anything, is couched in long established systems, again, by and for white men, largely. I think about Du Bois and his theory of double consciousness from the souls of black folks that posits there is an internal conflict experienced by subordinate or colonized groups in an oppressive society. I know that I feel this when I'm on campus or in a classroom or at a conference or presenting with invitations at this event, that there is my Americanness and there is my blackness and my queerness that is uh, in some kind of war with one another, that there exists this tension and it's not really any of my own doing. Right, Black people in this country are asked to assimilate, to put on their banana republic best, to talk like the masses, walk like the masses, wear hair that replicates the status quo and not be ghetto, don't be ghetto, don't be accommodating, or rather be accommodating, you know, don't threaten, tame yourself, lose yourself, let go of yourself, abandon the richness that is your blackness in order to keep white people comfortable and at ease. And while its very name seems to perpetuate the myth that only white people can practice whiteness, I suggest you examine the practices of say one Dr. Ben Carson in irrefutable proof otherwise. Therefore to walk through this life and in this country as a black person is to be reminded of this 24 seven, I mean, honestly, 25 eight, and to be steeped like fine tea into double consciousness. Whiteness assumes that white is right, the best and the goal. I'm gonna share my screen. Mm. Um, give me just a second. I have way too many tabs open. We're going here. That's the Zoom. Okay, let me take this all here. Thank you, computer. And here we go. Let me make sure this is loud enough. Let me talk to you about retirement. Before 401k is the most sound way to go. Let's talk asset allocation. Sure. You seem knowledgeable, professional. Would you trust me as your financial advisor? I would. I would indeed. Well, let's be clear here. I'm actually. I have no financial experience at all. That really is. If they're not a CFP pro, you just don't know. Find a certified financial planner professional who's thoroughly vetted at Let's Make a Plan.org. CFP. Work with the highest standard.
That is so wild. It never gets old. It never gets old. I need to. <laughs> I just have to sit with that for a minute. I'm a DJ. Right? It is wild. Um, and yet here we are. My institution attracts a particular kind of student, right? One interested in politics, certainly, public affairs, policy, environmental and international issues, and wanting to do their part to make the world a better place. Prior to the pandemic, 70% of our undergraduates studied abroad, and our student population is made up of scholars from over 120 countries, which is wild to me. And yet I think back to my own first year as a research and instruction librarian and a student that I worked with that fall semester. They approached me on the research desk with an assignment from their first year writing professor to examine identity, both their own and it in contrast with those different from them. This student, male, cisgender, white, said that he had never really thought about his identity because he was never forced to think beyond it. I remember being taken aback from the time I could sit up and was made deftly aware of my race and the color of my skin. I've thought about it all the time. I knew early on that there were people who had far more wealth than our working class family and others still with less. I grew up 15 minutes from the international border in Southeast San Diego. My neighbors were other working class black families as well as immigrants from the Philippines, Cuba, Japan, Mexico. I heard international accents on my block as well as country drawls from those in other Navy families from places like Georgia, Texas, Louisiana. All of us othered because of the implications of whiteness. Many years later, I think about this student who has long since graduated and is out in the world. And I think about how they never really thought much about their identity. And in that session together, in that half hour we had on the desk, we found articles in sociology and economics and media studies and gender studies. And we explored the underclass and how that contrasted with the lives of others with more power and privilege they walked away with a better sense of the world that they were born into and those navigating their lives under the thumb of oppression. And that day with that student informed so much of what I do, not just in my library work, but as a person of the world. And I also know firsthand with work and commitment that change is possible. So how did we get here? because America's whiteness is the standard, we are all told implicitly and overtly that that is what we should strive for. The American dream, right? The job, the SUV, the finished basement, white beauty standards, the Costco membership, and all the trappings that go along with attaining success. How does one earn it? hard work and merit, reward me for my labor, pay me what I'm worth. You didn't get that promotion? Did you try pulling yourself up by your bootstraps? Because that's what worked for me. And so when you have whiteness, the standard that tells you all of this is yours and everyone else is beneath you, and maybe they're American, but maybe they're not a real American, not a white American, that somehow immigrants and people of color are taking away something from that America that is yours simply by domination and colonialism. And now as we see birthright, and it is such an incredible flex to me, it doesn't seem real. I am um, have thought a lot this week about women's reproductive health and health in general. And, um, you know, I, I feel like so much of this could be kind of reinforced by what my late grandmother would say. Her motto was mind your business. Just mind your business. Mind your business. Why are you wearing that mask? Mind your business. 
reinforced by 400 plus years of chattel slavery, of 400 plus years of unjust practices that uphold white supremacy, of ebbing and flowing red line borders of neighborhood homes and accompanying housing values and unfair credit practices of injurious illegal policing and literal assassination carried out and upheld by the state in these United States streets by badge and gun holders with the full authority and exoneration of precincts from Los Angeles and Chicago and Milwaukee and Atlanta and Minneapolis and Cleveland and Louisville and New York City and Orlando and everywhere in between and all that we can do bereft and heavy with grief and loss is say their names. There are whole ass real world systems that continue to give those with one characteristic and one characteristic only the upper hand, white skin. People like to put forth the idea that there are two Americas. I like to offer the alternative. There is only one America and it is working exactly as it was designed. So when this is your livelihood, and either you don't bother to read and understand Bell Hooks or Kimberly Crenshaw or Derek Bell or Mary Matsuda or Audre Lorde and Richard Delgado, and you think, for example, that colorblindness will eliminate racism, that racism is a matter of individuals and not systems, and that one can fight racism without the need to pay attention to other mitigating examples of intersectional oppression and injustice, such as sexism and transphobia and economic exploitation. This is how the People's House, the US Capitol, finds itself being run rampant like it was on January 6, 2021. There are people who feel in their heart of hearts that they think that this America is theirs and theirs alone. And to question votes and elections and to seek justice, to want fairness and equality is somehow beholden to them and only them. It is easy to reduce black folks to smart, alecky sitcom sidekicks and black women to quick-witted neck rolling sassy baby mamas and to think of us only as rappers or entertainers or athletes or pop cultural social media viral aspirational influencer dance meme fodder friends i assure you we are so much more than that and since this is america oppression trickles down which is why we have also seen racism propagate in medicine with Henrietta Lacks and the Tuskegee Airmen or the astronomical number of black women who today are dying in childbirth. Or tech, algorithms that can't account for dark skin on facial recognition scans, which is already problematic. Or business, the aforementioned redlining and credit fiasco and generational wealth or higher education, appropriating anti-racism in the dreaded EDI committee. <laughs> I'm gonna do, let me, actually, let me stop and look at the, you know, like the EDI, like, can I see a show of hands if you've been asked to do the work on the EDI committee? Can you come and represent, like, I know that I'm often asked to be the black face or the queer face to represent all black people and queer people as if I speak for everyone, right? It is a vibe and it is almost offensive. It is certainly emotional labor that I do not wish to carry out because I have enough to do. Okay. So on the 6th of January, 2021, I had a lot of people reach out and text and call and email, D, are you okay? Where are you? You ain't by the Capitol, right? Tell me you're safe. Tell me you're safe. Tell me you're good, fam. And when I said I was safe at home, as safe as one can be prepping for the new burgeoning semester because it was January, while we were all in shock, a lot of my white friends seemed to all be asking a question, a question that has come up a lot 
but especially a lot over the past five or so years. How did this happen? This is America, but this looks like something from overseas. Is this a coup? It's so scary. What's happening? My Black friends, though, we didn't really talk about it. We were, of course, just as horrified, but maybe not as shocked or surprised. We are, after all, in America, and we are Americans. We live here, blackity, black, black, black Americans. Mm, I'm going to bring up another clip to share with someone who could say it much better than I ever could. Thank you, computer. Judge me by my deeds. That's right. Arthur Ashe was here, the late Arthur oh, Ashe. Yes. And he said to me, as he had said at one other place, he said, in a much quoted comment, he said, <coughs> living with AIDS is easier than living with racism. It's a harder struggle against mm. racism for me mm. than it is against AIDS. Mm. What it meant to me is that there's no way for the rest of us to understand that daily encounter, which brings me to my question to you. Do you still have that encounter? Do you, Tony Morrison, Pulitzer Prize winner, successful, honored in the halls of academe, mm. et cetera, still have that encounter? Yes, I do, Charlie, but let me add, tell you, that's the wrong question. Okay, what's the right question? How do you feel? Not you, Charlie Rose, right. but don't you understand that the people who do this thing, who practice racism, right. are bereft. There is something distorted about the psyche. It's a huge waste, and it's a corruption and a distortion. It's like it's a profound neurosis that nobody examines for what it is. It feels crazy, it is crazy. And it leaves, it has just as much of a deleterious effect on white people and possibly equal as it does black people. I always knew that I had the moral high ground all my life. I always thought those people who said I couldn't come in the drugstore and I had to sit in this funny place, I couldn't you go in the park. To them I did. And I thought they knew that I knew that they were inferior to me morally. I always thought that. And my parents always thought that. You said your father was racist because he always felt like he was he always superior. Thought, that's right. He always felt superior. And that was a form, you know, of, of, defended, of defensive racism. But if, if the racist white person, I don't mean the person who is examining his consciousness and so on, doesn't understand that he or she is also a race, it's also constructed, it's also made, and it also has some kind of serviceability. But when you take it away, I take your race away. And there you are, all strung out. And all you got is your little self. And what is that? What are you without racism? Are you any good? Are you still strong? Are you still smart? Do you still like yourself? I mean, these are the questions. It's Part of it is, yes, the victim. How terrible it has been for Black people. Sure like that. I'm not a victim. I refuse to be one. And the victim is the other person who is morally inferior. And that's what that's a serious question. To of course. Racism if you to have to hold that's or right. his or her own self-esteem and definition. If you can only be tall because somebody's on their knees, then you have a serious problem. And my feeling is white people have a very, very serious problem. And they should start thinking about what they can do about it. Take me out of it. Then give white people some free advice. <laughs> They're all in my books. <laughs> okay, I for real, like I also wanna cuss Charlie out. Cause no, he at the end, right? Did he really ask her? Which is, I mean, I hate to use the word cancel, right? Cause we know it's, it's like this kind of pejorative, provocative term, but I'm glad that Charlie got canceled. Um, so all of this to say, 
that this is what my work examines. And when I call this conversation connecting the dots, right? I, I think that there's something about what we bring to the table and what we have uh, in who we are as people. Again, I grew up in Southern California. I grew up riding skateboards and listening to punk rock. I grew, I ended up coming out, right? I grew up the son of Southern, you know, people like all these things have made me who I am as a person. Um, you know, there is this language now, right? Again, other language I find to be provocative and pejorative, right? You know, to be woke, these woke liberal mobs. And I don't, don't necessarily like to kind of define myself by those monikers, right? Like I was, you know, my grandfather was a minister, right? I was taught to love neighbor as I love myself. It sounds really simple, but that really is this kind of way in which I live my life. I think about all of these pieces that are the house of cards that have made me who I am. And I continue to connect those dots in life and in the library. And I'm grateful for every uh, job that I didn't get, for every denial, for every refusal, for every door that opened, for everyone that ever gave me a chance. And I hope that this is something that I can impart with my students and with my colleagues in my organization and in my library. And uh, with that, I wanna thank you for spending some time with me this morning. And I look forward to uh, the conversation to come. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, people of Minnesota. I appreciate you. Thank you so much, Derek. That was just really powerful. And thank you so much for being here with us. We really appreciate Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you. But yes, you would like a conversation. So folks, feel free. Yes, yes. Let's talk. Let's chat. Let's see. Hey, Robin. Hi, Robin. I, I can say a few words. Please come on in. Okay. I Let's go, cousin. Hey, okay, no, no, no. Let's come on through. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, as a, a person of color who has a lot of the identities that you have, um, I'm from the South originally. Um, I'm part of the GLBT community, I'm a person of color. Um, a lot of what you said really resonated with me and it's really just great to have you here. I don't know if I've ever seen someone who has your identities, who is blackly, blackly, black, talking to me in a library conference. So I'm just happy to see you. Keep no. doing things. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I um, am always gobsmacked when people ask me to come talk at these kinds of events. Um, because I think that, um, I don't know, I don't know why. Like, I feel like I just kind of walk through life the way that I do. And um, I am fortunate and I am honored that people hold me and my work in such esteem. Um, I'm happy to have these conversations to spark future conversations. Um, you know, I'd like to kind of go into this and I don't, my goal isn't to like dunk on white people, right? My goal is to really examine these systems and these structures and why are they in place? And it's great that you drive a Prius and you recycle and you love Sasha and Malia Obama, right? But like, does your library, what does your library org chart look like and why? And you can do your, you know, Dr. Kendi, you know, Robin, you know, web, you know, book groups, but like, are you really doing anything to kind of bring people, um, not just into the profession, but into positions of leadership and to kind of give them a platform and to not, you know, kind of immediately pluck them for the EDI committee and have them be, you know, on the search committee. You know, it's just all these, all of these things I think are just, let's have these conversations. You know, I think it's so important. So no, thank you. It's happy. I'm really happy to be with you and thank you for, for saying hello. Others, don't be shy. My cat is staring at me. My cat might want to make a cameo appearance. I'm, I'm, they're looking a little, I don't know. Others, let me check the chat because I'm 
doing double duty. <laughs> Barb knows. <laughs> Barb knows. It looks like Miss Bubula is much more concerned with her feeding tree. So I have, sorry, I didn't raise my hand. Oops. Um, hi. I am going to try to talk my way into a question. Let's do it. <laughs> because I have a lot of thoughts that are percolating. Um, I think one of the things that I've always, at, at least in my experiences, there's been a tension around is that idea of like the, the whole tokenism and being on the EDI committee or being on that search committee as that person. And right, that, that I think originally was sort of a, well, this is a way, this is part of our diversity efforts. We need to have these voices be parts of these committees. And I think that like I, one of the, so that tension then is how do we not do that? Like, and how do we get BIPOC voices and LGBTQIA voices into these spaces um, without doing that? Especially, I just have to say in Minnesota, that is right. very white, really. Sure. No, I think a lot of it, is are the institutions like how many people of color how many queer people how many fill in the blank people are at an organization right like if you are asking the one black person right if you are asking the one trans person if you are asking the one like there needs to be more than just the one um they are there is already enough being kind of put upon any kind of marginalized person and um you know i i remember <laughs> there's a faculty member i work with now who was on a search me this is years ago and we and i think i was brought in because i do talk about how do we kind of really spread the word and get word out to atypical types of places to kind of really bring in voices of of, of marginalized people and this one individual was like well we have and then identified the one kind of person of color as if his school doesn't look like, you know, Goldman Sachs, right? And so there is, you know, it's, 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 um, I think a lot of it in this work is that there has to be more than just like the one or the two. Um, and then you can't, like, it can't be this revolving door where you're constantly kind of asking the same people kind of over and over again. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's a lot. You know, but like even that, like how do we even get to that point, right? Where we're not exhausting the people. Um, you know, I think a lot about people, um, and this is like it's so offensive to me. People say, oh, I don't know if they'd be a good fit. Like, what what? These aren't trousers. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? And um, you know, when it, and that is usually subtle coded language for kind of um keeping marginalized voices down but it's it's going to take work and it's going to take all of us and i think it's going to take people advocating right for people who don't necessarily have the voice or the power to do so i see another person has raised their hand please come into the conversation yeah um i don't know if it's just an arld board conversation but <laughs> i was gonna say so i am the uh, only person of color in my, as a librarian in my library. But, um, and I remember when I started, uh, I will say I'm, there's only also one male librarian. So our library is primarily white female, which is again, very common. Um, when I came in, I had this moment that I think all people of color do where you're like, oh, I need to volunteer for that. ED. I need to like, I mean, I was new. So you want to like join committees and get involved, whatever. Then I was like, I definitely need to just join the BIPOC, whatever group and the EDI group and do all this stuff. And I made a really conscious decision not to. <laughs> I'm trying to say like no to things. Mm. Um, and we already had somebody who was in charge of the EDI who was a great job, who is white and she did it fantastically. And I sort of chose to just like let her keep leading and like not bring it up and focus in other areas. And that's been fantastic. Mm. Um, and I think the, the like, I think 
there's a certain amount of guilt that people of color feel that I definitely had around like, I need to be doing more. I should be mm-hmm. like volunteering and like, right? Like making the world a better place. And I'm sure everyone has this guilt right around like not making the world a better place enough all the time. But like as a person of color, in a position where there are not a lot of people of color, I need to somehow be like advocating for all people of color all the time, mm-hmm. which you can do. So trying to figure out where to focus my energy. So trying to join like search committees or other things that might have like different um, impacts maybe mm-hmm. um, then and, and letting people who are white and interested keep doing the great work that they want, like keep doing the things that they can do. You right? know what, let me, there's, I'm thinking about that, but there's also this, and I think about this a lot because I feel like I do a lot of stuff that is like student facing, right? Public facing, I mm-hmm. you know, love teaching, love being in the classroom, is that a student of color can see me and ask to borrow a stapler. And that student will, will ask me for the next four years Anytime they see me at, at, at the Starbucks, at the Target, hey, Mr. Librarian, hey, what's going on, D? What's going on? Hey, hey, hey. Where, you know, and they may have just asked me, like, for where's the bathroom, right? And, as a freshman. And then for four years, <laughs> anytime they see me at the dentist, hey, Mr. Librarian, what's going on? And so, like, that is doing a lot of the heavy lifting. It doesn't have to be this de- demonstrative, right? Like, Let's burn down the systems, right? Let's 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 march, you know, down Connecticut Ave. It can also be that. I mean, again, I am in Washington D.C., where we will student professors will actually cancel class if there's a protest. So there's that, right? But it doesn't necessarily have to be something so demonstrative, right? It can be just giving someone a stapler, right? So don't underestimate the work just that your visibility, yeah has right just seeing you behind a desk or being in front of a classroom or talking to them about whatever the information (laughs) literacy framework right does a lot of the heavy lifting right and by the same token um i think you know and up to kind of like flip that you know i'm perfectly fine with anybody who was invested in this work help shoulder that work you know black Mm -hmm. people are 12% 12% of the America's population. And if we got every Black person in this country on board to do the work, it would not be enough. If we don't ask our white brothers and sisters and cousins and friends and loved ones and people in our lives to also help shoulder that burden, then we're not going to get anywhere. And so let the <laughs> if white people want to lead the EDI committee if they're good people on board. Because by the same token, baby, I got some black folks that are terrible and I do not want them on the EDI committee, right? And I think that they, people of color will often get a pass because, oh, you must know oppression. You must know struggle. You must know what it's like to have someone's foot on your neck and they are the last people you want. So, you know, there um, there are other factors I think at play, but I think at at the base minimum, like, you know, I've, I've never seen a black man librarian before. Like I get that all the time. Um, you know, and, and almost to the to the to the to a deficiency where I've had students say like, "Oh, I need to meet with a librarian." I say, "Oh, well, how can I help you?" No, no, I need to meet with a librarian. Right? The assumption is that I'm not a librarian, um, and so it works. And it's a double-edged sword, right? But I think just being there, just showing up physically and being seen, does a lot of the lifting. Yeah, for sure. All right, thank you for that. Others, I'm trying to be mindful of the time. Kitty has walked off and is not interested in being on camera, so I'm sorry, Minnesota friends. Kat is checked out. There are a couple of uh, good comments in the chat if you have that open too. Yes, let me open up. Okay, let's see. Think about how every day is a struggle to deal with it. Yeah, it is. Um, Even just, um, I'm thinking about what Tim has shared in the chat. Um, You know, I'm a people person, right? Like I like people and I think, um, you know, connecting with people is is one of my strengths. When I finished uh, my library program, my father said, I'm not surprised you became a librarian because you always like to read. And I was like, do you think I go to work and read every day, old man? No, 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 not even. I have a professor rank, 
Like I teach, like 75% of what I do is teaching. I'm in the classroom, I'm working with junior faculty. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit in our um, session later about OERs and the work that I'm doing there. Um, you know, I love blowing students' minds when they figure out how we're gonna do something and we're gonna use Google at all, right? We're gonna find stuff in these resources that we pay thousands and thousands of dollars for. You know, but it's tough because um, the legacy of these systems in place um, are comfortable and convenient and change is hard. And it's, uh, it's a marathon and not a sprint. But yeah, I think if we keep things people-centered and human-centered that we'll never, um, you know, that's a good place and we're never, we'll never be wrong if we think, I think if we keep people at the heart and the core of what we do. Libraries to me aren't buildings. You know, there are people, I was talking to a, a, a local reporter here who was like, I just love little free libraries. Let's talk about little free libraries. And I was like, I like, I like reading. I am a librarian, but like, let's not misconstrue the fact that a library is not necessarily a building. Um, and what we're doing is connecting people and resources and the things that they need um, beyond, I don't know, Danielle Steele. Okay, other conversations. Well, I feel like this is really community work. I've really learned a lot about um, kind of organizing and activism through my time in post Katrina New Orleans, which, you know, I was, I worked at three different schools and six different departments. And, you know, a lot of my work was people coming in off the street who were getting their FEMA paperwork and needed to fill their FEMA paperwork out so they could get reimbursed because they had lost everything. And I'm not going to say, well, you're not a student here. I can't help you. Um, no, I'm not going to do that. And, um, you know, New Orleans had at that time, I mean, I moved to New Orleans five years after the storm. And there were many places in the city where it looked like the storm had just happened, where tarps were dried and faded on top of abandoned houses. And abandoned houses were next to empty lots, which were next to houses that were being reconstructed, which were next to more empty lots. And um, it was a tough, it was a really tough go. And I talked about the, you know, our little mobile housing unit, which had old, like, the computers look like the computers in the matrix, like the little green screen. I mean, these were old, antiquated, not fancy computers in a really wonky Wi-Fi hotspot. And I hadn't even taken one library school class at all. And they were saying, go forth. And I taught three classes before I took any classes at all in information literacy. And they were like, you'll figure it out. Like we have been through a hurricane, like figure it out. And uh, it was a lot. Um, you know, but I do this again because I'm people centered and people centric and you find a way, you really do find a way. I can make a comment slash kind of question. Um, hi, Derek, you, hi. this was really great. And I think you've left us with just a lot to, to think about. Um, what I've been kind of thinking about is um, new librarians coming into the, the field and kind of discovering. I think a lot of people have certain thoughts about what it means to be a librarian and work in libraries. And um, I know on Twitter, there's there's been some um, kind of drama around like, oh, librarians aren't positive enough. We're very negative about our field and just some of the problems with it. And you know, how do we balance being like hopeful for the future of, of libraries and where we could potentially take them, um, but also being really critical of how much white supremacy culture is ingrained in higher education um, and making sure that new librarians coming in um, and new library staff at whatever type of library will be kind of pre prepared for the reality of what it means to work in a library and in higher ed. Yeah, no, I think specifically when you think about it through this kind of higher ed lens, because that's, you take libraries out of it, like higher ed is like, woo, it's a whole lot going on there. Um, I, and I say this as someone who is completely aware of their Twitter presence and visibility. It blows my mind that I have as many followers as I do. I take long breaks because I just have to, because if I don't, between me and my therapist, like my head's going to explode, right? And so I do think, 
and, and this is, I think while this is accurate of Twitter, it's certainly um, accurate of like library Twitter, quote unquote library Twitter, is that it's, that's, it's, it's a lot like log off because people get real, there's people, and we see this in not just kind of, you know, in any kind of whatever ism, right? Any kind of fandom, any kind of whatever, people like to, people will say things on Twitter that they would never say in real life, would never say to your face and get real, as my grandmother would say, bigoty in their britches, right? And kind of just kind of talk to be, um, you know, starters of crap. And I, I do this work because I truly care about my students. I truly care about my organization. I think that knowledge is power. My mother was an educator. And one of the things that she said to me was, baby, they can never take your education away. They can burn your degree up and you still got the knowledge. And so for me, it's about, you know, working with, the, I, was, I, work, I was working with a student apparently in their first year. And this was, um, this was a couple years ago. This was before the pandemic and I was having a terrible day. And it was like lunchtime. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go home. Like, like I, I'm not getting anything done. I don't feel valued. My heart, like I'm just meh. And I was going across the street to take the shuttle to the transit station. And um, while I was waiting for the light to change, this young woman came up to me. She's like, Derek, Derek, hi, hi. You're in, a, you're in a library, you're in a library. How are you? And I was like, oh, I'm doing great. How are you? And she was like, you don't remember me, um, but you were our librarian my first year. And you came and you talked to us about Beyonce and how Beyonce was a 21st century feminist icon. And I was like, that totally sounds like something I would do. Don't remember, but whatever. And um, did this stuff and we talked, you know, we started with Beyonce because, you know, the students love Beyonce and Lemonade and Coachella and whatever. And we started there, but then we go into, you know, first wave, second wave, third wave. And we kind of talk about like the history of feminism and like all of these, you know, things. And she was like, and I just, I never forgot that. And I'm graduating now. And I just found out that I got a Fulbright and I'm going to France to go teach in a commune in France. And I was just like, <laughs> so it's like, it's those kinds of little tangible things for me that make it right. When I get money in my budget that says, hey, spend $3,000 on board games. Like that does it for me. Spend $5,000 on graphic novels and comic books. Spend $2,000 on cookbooks. Like these things that I never thought would be in my wheelhouse. Those things make it for me. It's, it can be so easy. And let me tell you this morning, I was talking to a friend of mine and I was like, they are really saddled with this vocational all, right? Like Fobazi has, co has coined this term, my good friend Fobazi Etar. And um, I love my librarians, right? But sometimes turn, turn your librarian off, right? And we talk about going out and touching grass, but for real, like it's like, it, it, you know, and we see this like with like nursing, right? We see it with teaching. We see it with like, you know, people that work in faith communities, this like, this, uh, un, like this, this rigor, right? To be seen as good people, to do the good work and I'm gonna fix it. You're not gonna fix racism. I mean, I wish I could fix racism. I, I, if you don't get tenure for ending racism, change jobs. Like that institution is Rudy Poot, find yourself a new institution, right? But I do feel like there is this like, like need to like, I'm gonna fix it. And I think that maybe we have given our librarian, you know, new librarians and existing librarians too much. I don't know what to call that, but like, let's, let's be realistic with what we can do. Like I buy books, I teach classes. I hope to be inspirational, right? I hope that my heart is on my sleeve. I feel like with me, what you see is what you get. With me, what you see on Twitter is what you see is what you get. Like, I'm going to talk about books. I'm going to talk about structural, you know, uh, structural racism. I'm also going to talk about Rihanna. I'm also going to talk about tacos, right? Like, I'm not just a librarian 24-7. I have a life outside of the profession. And when I talk about connecting the dots, it's about, apparently, I talked about Beyonce and feminism, right? And it made this student's life and got them into a full bright like you know I, I don't want to responsibility for that but certainly that was something that touched them in that way and I think that when we lower the stakes a little bit 
and acknowledge who we are and bring ourselves into our jobs. Like I'm from San Diego, right? Like I'm covered in tattoos. Like I wear Levi's and Vans to work every day. Like I'm just not gonna put on my like library and drag. I'm just not gonna do it. And I think students respect that. They get that. I'm not trying to be something that I'm not. And I think that when you are your true authentic self and you can connect those dots from your life into your professional life and let people see you for who you are and the values you stand for, that they pick up on that. And that is what makes the difference. So I hope that's helpful and shines some light. Thank you. Thank you for that. I am so sorry to cut this short because this is so great. Um, we are five minutes over time though. So I think we should, no, it's totally fine. So we should end now and just say, thank you so much, Derek. We appreciate you. This was amazing. What a great conversation. Thank um, you. It's let, good to be with you. I'm so glad. Let's put in a plug. If you want to talk more with Derek um, in the round tables in the next session, um, he has a featured round table. So I'm like, come on through my own, my own round table. Anyway, yeah, so <laughs> through. Thank you. With Derek. <laughs> and thanks to everyone at the, at the conference. Thanks to Jenny. Y'all don't know. Jenny has been a real one. So please give it up to Jenny and everyone on this conference that has been so helpful in bringing this to fruition because she is the lightning and the thunder. I'm just going to put that out there. So thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Enjoy your conference. I'll see you thank soon. You. Cheers.